Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Adventures in Dolls, a UFDC's YouTube channel. Today our program is on antique Japanese dolls, and it's presented by our friend Mr. Alan Scott Pate. Um, Alan is an expert and an author on the subject. He um, studied in France, Korea, and the United States. He has a master's degree in East Asian Studies from Harvard University. He is considered to be the premier dealer and authority on antique Japanese dolls outside of Japan. He's dedicated to the hidden world of Japanese antique dolls. He shares them through his gallery and his books and his other publications and his programs. So please enjoy Alan Scott Pate's fascinating world of Japanese dolls. <laughs> when I start talking about Ningyo, I have to sort of back up a couple of steps because everyone has their own sense of what, uh, anyway, um, people have their own sense of dolls and doll collecting. And I found this image because this is sort of, to my eye, the antithesis of Japanese dolls. But if anyone knows the origin of this photograph and the individual there, uh, because everyone has their own archives and familiarity, please contact me at some point because I bought this this photograph of this woman with this amazing collection, great photograph. I really don't know who she is. And I'm trying to fill in some details. But from the Western doll perspective, frequently it has to deal with children dolls. It has to deal with dolls that are part of, uh, you know, your upbringing and things like that. But when you're moving into a Japanese ningyo context, you have to sort of enlarge your thought. You have to sort of expand and embrace concepts of doll that perhaps are a little bit foreign. So, for example, in Japan, you have ningyo that are reserved for protecting children from measles. Uh, you have dolls that were presented from the emperor to visiting daimyo as a diplomatic gift. Um, you have dolls that are reflective of Japan's rich kabuki uh, theatrical experience. Um, you have dolls that are puppets that uh, command some of Japan's greatest literature was actually written for Ningyo, or for the uh, Bunraku puppet stage, uh, that are classics to this day. You have uh, objects of Iki Ningyo, which were hyper-realistic dolls, a used sort of like a Madame Tussaud wax museum, just sort of you went and experienced these really amazing hyper-realistic dolls. And then, if, uh, and then you have dolls, uh, wig dolls, costume change dolls, dolls that were reflective of fashion and trends over a long period of time. And then, of course, you have play dolls. You have dolls that were designed for children, depicting children, something a little bit more akin to the type of figure that we're familiar with or the West is familiar with as a doll. But today we're going to deal with uh, two specific doll festivals. And Japan's unique in the world in that dolls play such an important role in the culture. 
sort of woven very much into the woof and the weft of Japanese, the fabric of Japanese society. So we're talking about the Girls' Day display or the Hina Matsuri that takes place on March 3rd. And then we're gonna also talk about Tango no Seku or the Boys' Day a celebration which takes place on May 5th. So I'm gonna break down each uh, and talk about some of the cast of characters and the history and that type of thing, and then, and then recap at the end of that. So for the Girls' Day, this might be an image that many of you would be familiar with, sort of a style, a tier representing a stylized imperial court, uh, ladies in waiting, footmen, uh, musicians, that type of thing. Over the course of time, uh, 15 dolls became sort of codified as essential to this display. Of course, you have uh, the imperial couple. Frequently in English, it's called the, the emperor and empress, which is actually wrong. It's the daidi bina or the imperial couple or the a couple from the, imper uh, the inner palace. So to, they're not representing a specific emperor and empress, nor are they act representing that, that institution. It's more the imperial family, that type of thing, as opposed to an emperor and empress. But people say it so often, I fall into it. But they're technically the imperial couple from the inner palace or the uh, deity bina, male and female, of course. Uh, your ladies in waiting, your son in kanjo. Then you have your Gonin Bayashi or the five musicians. And, and as a quick add on here, each of these type of doll forms it received a lot of lavish attention. And so people can collect just this form and, and find just an infinite variety, even within the Gonin Bayashi. So it's sort of a fun uh, discovery thing when you start delving deeply into each one. Uh, the Zvijin or the minister of left and right, uh, the Shicho or the three footmen, uh, and then an expanded sets, you have, you know, ladies pulling a, a flower card or uh, ladies, court ladies holding a chin or chin, what they call chin biki or a chin dog. Um, but at root, at root, we have to go back basically uh, to about 13,000 BC, going way deep into Japanese antiquity uh, to the Jomon period where uh, these uh, prehistoric clay figures called dogu uh, were used in fertility rituals and were a very, very important part of uh, culture. So clay dolls from the very beginning, or one can just elaborate and just say dolls from the very beginning had this very deep, powerful role and meaning within Japanese culture. And I argue that one can draw uh, a line, a continuous line of development from this deep antiquity of 13,000 BC to the present day. So you evolve from dogu to uh, figures called haniwa or circles of clay. And these were funerary dolls made of clay that were placed around what's called a kofun or a key shaped funerary mound for uh, emperors and empresses and people of a very, very high stature. Um, so this is an aerial photograph of one of those key mounds. And those, uh, the haniwa figures would have been distributed around, buried in the ground around that tomb in lieu of human sacrifices. Uh, and that was a, a very, uh, for, for the elite, a very strong practice. So Ningyo, again, doll form continuing uh, as, it expand, as we expand and think of more commonplace for the common man, uh, you have hitogata or human shaped forms, uh, stick, simple rudimentary, rudimentary stick forms that were used uh, to protect uh, cities, to protect individuals, frequently burned ritualistically or buried ritualistically. So again, this idea of the continuity of, of dolls playing a very strong um, ritual role in Japanese culture. And as we move, jump forward to the, the present day, we find vestiges of that within the Girls' Day display as it's practiced in different parts of Japan. So this is Awashima Jinja, which is out outside of uh, the greater Osaka Bay area, uh, Wakayama prefecture. Uh, and on my tour back in 2016 or 17, uh, I took a group of doll collectors there to actually see the ritual as it takes place at Awashima Jinja. It's a fascinating place. The, 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 sh the shrine uh, is uh, throughout the year is receiving and collecting dolls of all shapes and sizes of all ilk from Ichimatsu to Hina here to other types, and they're collected throughout the year. And then on March 3rd, these dolls are ritually blessed. Uh, and then they are, a token selection of them are then individually placed in these wooden boats. And then these boats, three of them are hoisted on shoulders and then paraded through the town, 
down to the water's edge where further rituals and rites take place, purifying them and, and getting ready to send them off. And then they're, they're set adrift out into the ocean. Now, historically, they were set adrift and they were gone, but now because of environmental laws, they have to go back and bring them back in. Uh, but these dolls go out to sea and then they're, they're lost. Now, the dolls that remain uh, that are just not in these token boats are actually burned uh, in a ritual called a kuyo. And ningyo kuyo uh, take place uh, in many places across Japan. And this is a way, again, this ties into a very important point. And the reason why there are festivals focused on dolls is that ningyo in Japan can serve as uh, uh, what's called a yorishiro or a temporary re residing place for spirits to come in. And so after our dolls have been in the family a certain period of time, and perhaps they, they you know, the, the family uh, needs the room or the family is dying off or individuals need to get rid of the collection, rather than just selling them or disposing of them, they are ritually burned to release elements, release impurities, uh, and, and to sort of uh, act as a purification element. And that's not something that we normally would do. I don't imagine someone would think about taking their Barbie or whatever doll you collect. It's like, oh, I really don't want to sell it. I'll just burn it in my backyard. That's just not how, you know, we think. But within the Japanese context, it makes total sense because these things are the animus or the locus of, of uh, spiritual forces that have to be treated uh, with care and honor and respect. And so the Hinamatsuri or the Girls' Day display that we're talking about, and we'll get into detail about it more, is um, a, a single doll-focused holiday in which those, those spirits come into play. Now, the form that the doll takes today also has a specific history. And so the next little bit, I wanna talk about the evolution of the forms uh, that the Hina dolls take. And one of the earliest shapes that we need to focus on uh, is this that's called an amagatsu or the, the heavenly child. And the heavenly child was placed uh, by a child's bedside. It's a rudimentary thing of bamboo dowels wrapped in silk, and then a child's clothing would be draped over that doll and placed by the child's bedside. Uh, bedside. And the belief was that malevolent spirits would not go into the doll, I mean, not go into the child, but they'd be attracted to the doll instead. So that doll protected the child by attracting malevolent spirits. Frequently, it's dressed in red, uh, things that, that actively attract uh, smallpox demons or, or other, other malevolent forces. And a child would keep this doll uh, throughout their life. A male would burn it uh, at his coming of age ceremony. And a girl, if they had an amagatsu, would keep it their life. Um, a female, more female oriented form is called a hoko, which is simple, again, rudimentary, rudimentary sewn silk stuffed uh, in more of a feminine shape. A hoko means a crawling baby. Uh, and so this pairing of a femaleish hoko with a more male amagatsu becomes the template of the male-female pairing of ningyo for the daidi vina or the imperial couple that, that, that formed the sort of the centerpiece of the hinamatsuri. And so this is a very easy leap. You can see the, the, the more cylindrical shape hoko, the more T-shaped amagatsu being translated here in what's known as a tachi vina or standing hina, and you can see behind me, there's a pair uh, right behind me of a tachibina. So initially they were done out of paper, so sometimes they were called kamibina, uh, but over time they became increasingly sophisticated, the textiles applied to them, quite elaborate, but they are also tied in to uh, a form uh, of a paper doll called a nademono, and a nademono was used to, you would rub the nademono all over your body, absorbing all the impurities, and then that, that doll, that paper doll, would be burned or set adrift or ritually destroyed to get rid of those influences. And so this, this you can see that there's this uh, inherent interweaving of doll with larger beliefs that take place. And so as we look at these forms, we can get transported by the beauty, we can get lost in their faces and textiles, but at core, there's a really strong uh, belief system uh, animating all of this. Um, so sometime in the very late 1600s, seated forms of the Daidi Bina began to be developed, again using very rudimental, using textiles that would have been, uh, you know, normal clothing or brocades uh, used for silk, uh, for screen mounting or for uh, um, uh, 
yes, screen or scroll mounting, that type of thing would be incorporated. There was no industry devoted to creating textiles specifically for the dolls. But as the dolls for, uh, doll forms changed and they continued to evolve as their popularity increased, you start finding a much more realistic interpretation of say, like this doll showing like the Gino, uh, Gino e or the 12 layer down of the Imperial Court. You can see all the layers uh, there behind her. But again, one of the, the themes of the Hina that is an interesting sort of combination is at core, you have these spiritual beliefs, if you will. At core, you have these really potent forces at work. But then you also have a love of luxury, a love of display, uh, a love of ostentation in certain circles. And so as the doll uh, festival on March 3rd, third day, third month became more and more popular, more and more energy, more and more money was invested in creating dolls appropriate to station and class, whether that be imperial, whether that be samurai nobility, whether that be wealthy merchant class, on down to, to the common man. Uh, and so you have this sort of a snowballing effect of sophistication within the forms itself. And uh, by the early 1700s, you have doll markets. You have atelier doll makers in, the, 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 in Osaka, Kyoto, to uh, Edo, Tokyo at that point, um, having uh, very elaborate shops and sales that took place just prior to the Hina Matsuri. So this is a, a very famous scroll painting uh, depicting um, uh, the, the marketplace along Nihonbashi. Uh, and this is what's called the Jikendana, or the doll, it's the doll area of, of, of Nihonbashi. And you can see the doll shops out there with the red mosin. Uh, and this was a such a seminal event. The commercialism became such a seminal event that poems were written about it, paintings were done, not only about the dolls, but about the frenzy the absolute frenzy around buying them and bringing them home and incorporating them. And of course, this led to oh, massive, amazing forms, 36 inches seated, uh, using real gold or real silver, luxurious textiles, so much so that the Japanese government stepped in periodically and issued sumptuary laws prohibiting what size, what materials could be used on Hina. I mean, imagine that the government stepping in and saying, oh, no, you know, you're, uh, I, I don't know what's a good, you know, I'm going I'm to use Barbie a lot because that's what the top of my head, your Barbie's too elaborate. You can't do that no more. Just not possible. But within the Japanese context, it did because the commercialism was so rife. And uh, apologists of the day began to think that people were losing sight of the importance of the festival and getting wrapped up in the commercialism of the festival. And that has a lot of echoes in you know western christian tradition about christmas and losing sight of that over the you know the fracas about shopping and, and the ornamentation of your tree same kind of thing was taking place in the hina display so as forms developed you have push counter push so the this form here the this large form that that received uh government pushback was known as the kyoho bina or the kyoho hina dolls and they emerged around 1740 and in, even though they're supposed to be representing an imperial, uh, sort of an uh, idealized imperial court, an imperial member, no, these are not reflective. The costuming here, the costuming here are not reflective of what was actually worn within imperial circles. So by the second half of the 18th century, you have the imperial classes pushing back and demanding Hina being done uh, where the costuming was exactly what they would wear true to their style, which is called yusoku. And, and there's very, various sides of styles of yusoku, but each one is representative of an accurate, a very de rigueur accuracy in its interpretation of how imperial court wear would have been done. Formal, uh, super formal, informal, that type of thing. But the artistry of the dolls themselves uh, is never uh, in doubt. Um, for those of you who really have no idea about the Japanese doll uh, component, one small aside, the faces that we're looking at, the hands where they appear, any of the skin surfaces that we're talking about today uh, are of a material called gofun, which is a crushed oyster uh, shell and animal glue that's applied in various la layers, and some of the layers are carved, a finer layer serves sort of like a porcelainous skin type of thing. Um, uh, it's incredibly unique to Japanese doll culture and Japanese artistic culture to begin with. So gofun is a, a wonderful, wonderful 
uh, and, and, and oddly uh, fickle kind of material to work with, but it's part of the magic. So her face here is a wonderful example of gofun uh, being used on a yusoku hina. So another style that evolved, uh, it was uh, the jiro zaimo uh, bina with their sort of ping pong ball shaped heads, uh, a Kyoto style that emerged and became all the rage uh, in the latter half of the 18th century. And then this was followed uh, very soon by the Kokin Bina, uh, which became to dominate. And actually, that's the pair that you can see behind me, uh, left and right. And Kokin means new old. There's lots of interpretations. But basically, this set the template that almost all Hina followed from there on out. It, it was a game changer uh, that emerged in the early 1800s. And from then on, it was basically Kokin or Kokin Light or Kokin Derivative uh, type of thing with a Yusoko component thrown in. And I have to apologize that you have to use Japanese vocabulary in describing Japanese dolls. And there's not going to be a quiz at the end, although Sally Freeman may, may ask for questions. Um, so, so don't worry about the names that I throw out. The whole idea here is just to sort of absorb the visuals, to just sort of get a sense of the contours of the form rather than worrying about this word or that word. What did he say? It really doesn't make any difference. It's all just a, all for fun. Uh, but the Kokin Bina here, dated box from the Meiji era. Uh, elaborate headset, but also you can see on them, uh, Kokin Bina had a wonderful play on the sleeves, on supplemental embroidery that depicted really wonderful forms. Here's a butterfly dancer. Uh, and again, at this point, it has no bearing on imperial court costuming. There was no court costuming that looked anything like this, but it was fantasy. It was fun. It was marketing. It was just what people wanted to display in their homes as opposed to trying to be, you know, uh, accurate uh, on any kind of you know, uh, what's the right word, you know, clothing standpoint. So uh, again, they're depicting the imperial classes. And so people frequently look at these dolls and go, huh, what's that? So we're going to start at the top. Uh, the smudges that you see at the top are called okimayu or sky brows. And they were seen as an imperial beauty mark. Uh, frequently, they would shave the regular eyebrows and then have these two smudges higher up. Uh, and so they became, they were a beauty mark, but also uh, ultimately became shorthand as a signal that they, that whoever was wearing them or a doll having them is part of the imperial classes. One will also notice that her teeth are completely blacked, blackened. And blackened teeth was not only a beauty thing, it was also a preservative, uh, uh, helped, helped uh, protect the teeth. And so that's also a sign of, of, of an imperial uh, uh, class component. So this is a beautiful Kokin Bina face. Again, that gofun, uh, very, very, uh, just so perfect in this e example. So frequently, um, it's difficult to know who made the doll specifically. Uh, frequently, you have atelier um, that, that make them. Sometimes people will remove the neck and say, oh, my doll has a signature on the neck. It's like, that's not a signature. That's a size indicator. Very, very rarely is there an actual signature on the neck. It does happen. It does happen, but in this particular instance, this says size number four, so not a signature at all. But uh, atelier, like Maruhe Okiheizo, they were suppliers to the imperial family. Yoshitoku in uh, Tokyo, or Edo, was also a supplier to the imperial family. And so sometimes you can find information related to the atelier that was selling the doll, uh, but because of the system of makers supplying to an atelier, it's very difficult to know uh, the actual artists, the, uh, the artist Sen who made, who made the doll. Uh, a final form in Hina are what are called Machibina or Town Hina. Uh, and Town Hina are interesting because you can see the doll here basically is just the head. There are no hands, there are no feet. There's this head, a crown, and this amazing textile. And once I was in the very, I was in uh, Kyushu in the southern part of Japan, uh, Oita, uh, city, and uh, I saw a sign saying world's largest Hina, and I had to go see what the world's largest Hina was, and so I ran around trying to find out. I finally got there, and it was a pair of Machibina, but it was basically a doll like this, where the doll itself wasn't so big, but the sleeves were like one story tall, so technically it was a very tall Hina, but the head was basically a normal head, so I, I felt a little let down, although at the same time impressed because some serious, serious, you know, uh, work goes into the textiles on the Machibina sleeves, particularly on the, on the female. Now, today, uh, the Hinamatsuri 
is very well celebrated, incredibly popular, all over Japan, every nook and cranny beginning very soon because we're here at February 22nd, very soon, March 3rd, we'll be here shortly, and all of Japan will be given over to Ningyo mania. Hotels will have displayed, department stores will have displayed, museums will have their stuff out, every town will have their Hina display. And so it's a very, very fun time to go to Japan, and I'll get to that later because I have another tour coming as soon as Japan opens up again. Uh, but it's a very interesting time to go to Japan because you'll never see more Ningyo, not just Hina, but of all stripes uh, during that period. Uh, and so this is an interesting counterpoint that today's incredible vitality of the Hina Matsuri compared to its male companion festival. And I'm going to shift to that right now. So the Tangu no Sekku, or Boys Day, uh, the fifth day display, is similar in that it has to deal with Ningyo harnessing spiritual power to protect the household, purify the household for the coming year. But in the Boys' Day context, it has a little bit more of an aggressive sort of, uh, well, it makes sense for Boys' Day, an aggressive component. So early in the festival's development, uh, young boys would run around the city with sheaths of iris leaves or mugwort, and then they would beat the ground over and over and over to drive away the evil spirits. And then they would also beat each other uh, and mock warfare, uh, all of this to, to drive out uh, malevolent influences. But over time, dolls made of iris leaves or made of mugwort were also used as talismans. And just as we saw in the Hina, simple, simple forms gradually gave way to increasingly complex, elaborate displays. And that was very much true in the Boys' Day display, where you have these woodblock prints from the period from the early, 16, uh, early 1700s show us very sophisticated Ningyo tableau depicting warriors from Japan's historical past that were displayed outside on the, in, on the fifth day of the fifth month, and people walking by would stop and ogle and oogle uh, these dolls. And some of them gained, if the woodblock prints are, are to be believed, uh, significant scale. Uh, they were sometimes known as kabuto ningyo, as it says on this print, kabuto ningyo, kabuto being a helmet, so helmet dolls. Uh, and there's a whole rationale behind that, but that would be a little, little too, too deep to get into today. But what is different, uh, one of the things, another thing that's different in the Boys' Day display is whereas the Girls' Day Hina were sort of symbolic, not representing a specific individual, the dolls for the Boys' Day represented very, as a general rule, very specific historical or legendary characters that formed sort of a codified pantheon of ningyo that were displayed. Uh, Tanamount was a Minamoto Yoshitsune, a very uh, important medieval warrior, uh, lots of tales of daring do, uh, betrayed, die young, all sorts of wonderful details. Uh, but he is, was an early, early go-to. And again, this is a great picture for the gofun. Uh, the gofun, I said, was a mixture of oyster shell and animal glue, and that's a recipe. So the more nikawa or animal glue, the shinier the gofun is. The more the, ni, the more the gofu, the more the shell against the nikawa, the more matte. And during the Edo period, shiny gofun was more in favor. And so frequently in Edo period, uh, which is uh, 1615 to 1868, you find a shinier gofun, whereas later dates sometimes it gets more matte. Uh, Yoshitsune himself was known as being incredibly ugly. Historically, he was not an attractive individual, but he has a great, a certain amount of dignity uh, when he's depicted in ningyo form and frequently of some scale. Now, as a size marker, this is my niece in Japan when I first found that piece that we were just looking at. Now, to be fair, Camille, I love her to death, but she's not very tall. She'll say she's five foot. She ain't. Don't, don't let her fool you. She's just shy of five foot, but that gives you a sense of the scale of the doll. He's a big boy, or was a big boy. He lives in Alaska now. So another figure uh, that is very, very interesting uh, that showed up early in this Boys' Day pantheon is Jingu Kogo. Now, Jingu Kogo is interesting because, one, she, this is a female warrior. So Jingu Kogo uh, was an empress shaman, uh, and she received messages from the gods that her husband should lead an invasion to Korea to conquer the continent and bring it under Japanese control. He vacillated, 
So the gods struck him dead, and she donned his suit of armor to lead this uh, naval armada, this expedition to Korea in his stead with the gods to help her and that type of thing. Now, uh, um, again, we see that she's emperor because she has those Okimayu sky brows and blackened teeth. So this doll is therefore showing us that she's of the imperial class. But the trick to the story comes, uh, she's accompanied by her minister Takanuchi no Sukune, sort of a Methuselah character in Japanese lore. But you'll see that she's, he's holding a baby in his arms. And that's because Jingu, as she decided to embark at the God's direction on this invasion of Korea, happened to be pregnant at the time. And pregnancy is inconvenient in a military operation. So she tied a girdle of rocks around her womb and delayed the pregnancy 19 months so that she could achieve her goals, come back to Japan, and give birth to the baby Ojin on Japanese shores. He, of course, becomes the Emperor Ojin later and is also a subject of Boys Day dolls uh, down the line. Uh, so Jingle, a very, very fascinating character for so many reasons. Uh, also, uh, this is not Jingle. So this, this, I'm going to back up. Sorry. Jingu is so important because, and interesting, because you also get into this whole uh, Gordian knot of Japanese-Korean relations that are still not solved. And so this idea that Japan uses dolls celebrating Japanese invasion of Korea, you know, touches a nerve. But it's interesting because there's certain uh, sectors of Japanese, I mean, Korean historiography says that Jingu is actually Korean. And that the rock symbolism and all that indicated that she was actually a Puyo Korean princess and that the invasion went the other way and that therefore the Japanese imperial line is Korean. That now is a debate. That now gets some tempers going and it's an ongoing, it's, it's, it's not in the past. It's a current active uh, discussion. So uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, a historic uh, figure known as the great unifier, lived in the late 1500s, shogun, military generalissimo, successful in unifying all of Japan, uh, but interestingly prohibited as a doll form until the 1800s. Uh, uh, you know, he himself, very successful, but he died before a complete realization could be uh, achieved of a unified Japan. Uh, he left uh, control to his uh, underage uh, son, uh, under the uh, governance of the Tokugawa family. And so as soon as Hideyoshi was dead, uh, they turned on the young uh, Hideyoshi Sion. Uh, and then uh, you have the beginning of the Tokugawa reign. And they didn't like dolls depicting Hideyoshi or anything related to political events dealing with the Tokugawa. So literally, it was illegal to have a play, to have a book, to have a painting, or to have a doll depicting Toyotomi Hideyoshi until uh, the early part of the 19th century. Again, very interesting because <clears throat> where would we find in a, analogous in the West dolls that strictly were just prohibitive uh, because of political sensitivity? Um, as um, Japan's history moved on and we get to the Meiji Restoration, and I'm sorry, you got to talk Japanese history. It's just part and parcel to make sense of all this stuff. With the Meiji Restoration in the 1860s, you have the emperor, the uh, office of emperor becoming the epicenter, not only spiritual, uh, but also political of the country. So beginning uh, in the middle part of the 19th century, when this whole thing was, was uh, getting steam, there was a strong focus on Ningyo that represented or supported the imperial line. So where, you know, who better than to go to Jimu Tenno or the legendary first emperor of Japan? Now, um, this doll is huge, a very, very large scale doll. I wanted to bring it out. It's in a box, but it was just, ah, I couldn't do Hina and him. But his belt buckle is a gold demon. It's just this really amazing, amazing set of, of uh, Jimu Tenno, uh, Fugima, and Dojin, or his two assistants. Uh, just a fantastic set by Maruhei Okiheizo, uh, but just the detail that went into this. And I realized that I was sort of getting off, sort of geeking out on Japanese doll history, but I lose track sometime of just how awesome these dolls actually are when you see them, you see the material, and you see what's going on. And since I've gone on and on about Gofun so much, you might want to see how 
The Gofun here is slightly pigmented. There's more flesh tone. And that was a development that took place beginning in the 1850s, where they would add a little tincture to the Gofun to create a greater verisimilitude with skin tone. So beginning at that time, a Gofun frequently has a small uh, pigmented cast to it. Uh, here in Fugima, you can see that quite well on his simulated tiger pelt and giant battle axe. Rough dude. Um, and in sort of keeping with uh, this theme of, of dolls depicting emperor, you have the Hachiman, um, Hachiman Taro, uh, who's deified as the god of war, who actually is supposedly Ojin. That little baby Ojin all grew, grew up, was celebrated as the god of war. And so this is a depiction of, of Hachiman Taro uh, in a medieval, uh, as a medieval warrior mounted on a white horse. Now, I don't know how well you can see, but that horse is carved of wood. And then the hair, the mane, of course, is silk, but the body hair is all grooved lines um, uh, within what? In gofun. All of that white on the horse is also gofun, but with scoured lines to simula simulate the fur and then inset glass eyes. So an amazing, amazing uh, rendition of uh, uh, Hachimantaro, again by the uh, Kyoto Atelier of Maruhei Okiheizo, also not small scale. Now, my favorite, my favorite story uh, is uh, 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 Minamoto Yorimasa. Now, one of the things that's interesting when you're looking at Ningyo is that as a pop, because they all, they're, they, I mean, they're forming a spiritual nexus in the doll display, but they're also a part of popular culture. So you have paintings and woodblock print, uh, you have kabuki performances, you have puppet performances, you have a lot of other cultural expressions depicting these same figures. Um, uh, and so when you are looking at them in a boys' day context, you have to realize that there are other uh, elements at play. <clears throat> Excuse me, so Yorimasa is famous for slaying the Nue. And so the story is that the emperor was having trouble sleeping. He was being terrorized at night by a demon. He called in Minamoto uh, Yorimasa to, to figure this out. And he was standing guard at the palace and he saw a shadow flying over the court and he shot his arrow in the sky and he killed the Nue. Now the Nue is this great beast that has the head, uh, let me see, it's the head of a monkey, the body of a tiger, and the tail of a snake all together. And so this is a big uh, painting of Yorimasa slaying the Nue. Uh, and that's his uh, Uyahata, his, his assistant, holding him down so that uh, Yorimasa can deal the, the final blow. And this is an amazing, amazing Ningyo tableau of Yorimasa and the Nue. Now, of course, Yorimasa, beautifully attired, silk brocades, absolutely extraordinary insect glass eyes, just an extraordinary rendition, uh, tall court cap, you know, uh, just, ah, uh, I love this thing. Um, Iehata, similar treatment, silk hair, uh, but also a carved component, all slaying the Nue, which is this monkey, badger, tiger, snake combo deal. Uh, and there, Iyahata has his hand down on the face. But when you look at the when you look at the Ningyo rendition of the Nue itself, ha ha, I love it. You, I mean, this is not a Barbie. This is Nue on steroids. So this is your monkey, uh, the Nue being being slayed by Yorimasa. So these are the type of tales uh, that were told uh, and part of the Boys' Day display. But what's interesting is that, as you've noticed. Uh, most of the images, most of the doll figures for the Boys' Day are military. Uh, they have to do with death and violence. And they're capturing a spirit called a Goryo. And a Goryo is sort of an aggressive, angry spirit. So when you look at someone like uh, Minamoto Yoshitsune, that first character that I talked about, he accomplished amazing things, but died tragically, died unfulfilled. And so people looked at what caused him to be able to succeed in life to the degree that he did and how angry he must be as a spirit if he didn't get to fulfill. So frequently, Musha Ningyo depict Goryo or angrier spirits or more aggressive aspects. And that, in displaying them as dolls, you were placating those spirits and you didn't want them to run amok in society. But as a display, with this focus on militarism, Japan in the war uh, and post-war had a really strong anti-military backlash. 
So dolls depicting warriors, samurai, that type of thing, really were not in keeping with the new vibe, the new zeitgeist post-war. So literally in the post-war Japan, Boys' Day was changed to Kodomo no Hi, or Children's Day, uh, eviscerating or taking away so much of the spirit and the animus that was a part of the Boys' Day tradition from the very, very beginning, replacing it more with family activities, going to a park, fathers playing with their sons, very benign, very, very sweet. Uh, and so more frequently today, the symbol for Boys' Day is not some warrior slaying a new egg or gutting his foe or lopping off his ear and collecting his ear, which is another story for another time. But you have cart banners symbolizing male progeny, or you have children dressed up as warriors being very, very cutesy. And so unlike the Girls' Day display, which still is very much alive and well, very much uh, consistent with historic tradition, Boys' Day today, Kodomohi, Children's Day, is nothing at all like traditional Edo period uh, Boys' Day festivals would be. So that when we look at it today, we're looking at a faint shadow of its former self. And we can all understand the sort of the political reasons why and the rationale, uh, but from a cultural and, a, and, and from a doll standpoint, uh, I kind of like, I kind of dig the guy with the sword. So anyway, so Chris thought that it would be good for me to talk a little bit about uh, the Japanese tours. I'm not gonna go on much. Um, for, for a while, I was holding a tour every other year, one in the spring, one in the fall, but then we all know what happened, COVID happened, and that's all got shut down. Originally, I was supposed to be leaving March uh, uh, 1st, uh, in a couple of weeks for this tour, uh, but clearly, since no one can go to Japan without a business visa or a residency permit, and you have to quarantine, that tour is not happening, but I am hoping against hope that by 2023, that tour will be back uh, on and strong. Uh, those of you who are in the group, I know some of you actually had signed up for it, and I hope you're working with Phil because the itinerary will be the same, everything will be the same, dates will be fungible, it's going to be fantastic, but it's a, a good time can be had by all. This was my last tour, which was a fall tour, and I'll be doing that again, and some of you in Zoom will recognize yourselves uh, there in the crowd. It was a great tour, and it's just been so sad not, not to be able to continue that. Uh, but trust, it's just a temporary hiatus. Uh, this was taken at Yoshitoku Doll Shop uh, that some of you have visited, even without my tour, and that's Aoki-san. Uh, everyone loves Aoki-san. That's him in front. Uh, and, and he will be uh, greeting us with open arms uh, and a very formal bow when we get there uh, next time. So stay tuned, and, and please let me know if that is of interest. Now, of course, shameless plug, final thing, uh, if it is impossible, it is impossible in any length of time, short or long, to explore all the contours of Japanese dolls. It, it, no, it's just not possible. So instead, I write books. I write a lot of them. So some of them are introductory, like the one on the left is sort of an introductory to Japanese doll culture. Up top is a Fairly heavy book at 560 pages on the Japanese Friendship Doll Exchange. Uh, the other one, Japanese Doll Fascinating World of Ningyo. Sort of a survey introduction of doll forms and what you can collect and how to collect and care for them. Uh, and then this is my most recent book, Ichimatsu, Japanese Play Dolls. All of these, of course, can be ordered through me on my website. I please encourage you to look at it. But also for fun, and you don't have to pay, I have developed a YouTube channel, uh, kind of surprising myself. And so there's a whole series of YouTube videos. Uh, if you go to YouTube, Alan Scott paid anti Japanese dolls, it shows up. If you can't find it, let me know and I'll send you a link. And, and during COVID, I was doing one a week. So about for 15 weeks, I did one a week and was exhausted, literally. Um, but uh, took some time off. Now I've started again, did a good, better, best evaluating Ichimatsu Ningyo in February. I have a new one coming out next month. Uh, it's technology, we're getting more and more slick. It's kind of fun. But also, if you're interested in exploring deeply the topic today, I have a whole YouTube video just on the Girls' Day display. That was YouTube video number 12, Joshi no Seku. And then, of course, I did one on just the Boys' Day, number 13. So if this talk tonight sort of, uh, you know, piqued your interest in any one of those, I have really in-depth videos available online for free that you can check out. Uh, so 
Uh, and again, if you want to contact me, there's sort of my contact thing, but I'm easily findable. Uh, you Google Alan Japanese dolls, I show up pretty quickly. And that, my friends, is the end of this presentation. Hello and welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Alan Scott Pate uh, for his generosity and, uh, and willingness to help us out and do a program for us. Uh, we really appreciate his support. Um, let's see. Remember, uh, if you have any comments, we'd love to hear from you. Do you have any Japanese dolls? What kind of dolls do you have? Uh, what would you like to see us present on this channel? Also, don't forget to like, hit the thumbs up, and subscribe. Remember, no fees involved. So, view in, like, and subscribe so you don't miss your next adventure in dolls. And please become a member. Of the United Federation of Doll Clubs, just simply click on the link at the bottom of the page, go to the website, sign up, and when you do, be sure to tell them Karen sent you. <laughs>